Captain. They are now locking lasers on us. Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dark. I'm Hujuana and today we're looking at some real advanced laser weapons and how they work. First, a brief description of how lasers function. They have three components, a light source to create photons, a lasing medium to copy paste those photons and turn them into a coherent laser, and a lens to focus and direct the resulting beam. They deal damage through transferring heat into a small area on the target, either vaporizing it or drilling through with mechanical shock from a pulsed laser. They have very long range and don't use ammo, but may need lots of radiators to keep them from overheating. Our first advanced weapon is the Free Electron Laser, or FEL or FEL. These have many advantages over the more well-known chemical or solid-state lasers I mentioned in the original laser weapons video, which generally use an expendable gas or reusable solid to copy-paste the photons given off by a light source. Fells are different since they create and then stack photons using electrons in the same part of the machine, but first the fell needs to push a stream of electrons up to near light speed with a particle accelerator. Then they enter a special arrangement of powerful magnets with alternating poles across the electron's path. This is called an undulator, though there is a variant with the much more fun name of Wiggler, because that is exactly what these magnets do to the electron stream. As the electrons are undulated side to side, they release photons. In turn, these photons interact with the electrons, causing the electrons to group up into microbunches that line up with the wavelength of the light. And since these micro-bunched electrons are still in the undulator, either because it's really long or has mirrors at either end, they keep making new photons. Because these new photons come from a series of bunched up electrons rather than a continuous stream, they are all in the same phase. They are a coherent laser beam rather than messy light. As this machine feeds upon itself, the laser it creates can reach extraordinarily high power levels, much higher than what the undulator puts into the electron beam itself. Unlike chemical or solid state lasers which are stuck to one frequency, the beams from a fell are completely tunable. By altering the velocity that electrons enter the undulator, or the magnetic field strength inside it, you can change what wavelength of laser light is made. This is a very handy feature for a weapon since you can dial it for different tasks, or if used in atmosphere, different weather conditions to avoid the laser's energy being absorbed by the air. That's especially useful for a sci-fi vehicle that's intended to work on all sorts of planets, like this alternate turret for the alien's APC. They can even go up to x-rays, but while very powerful, turning that into a practical weapon is gonna be hard. First, to make x-rays, you need very high velocity electrons from a big accelerator. And then, since you can't really reflect x-rays, because they like to go through things, you need a really long undulator. Overall, your x fell will be at least hundreds of meters long, and you can't put a regular lens on the end to aim it, again, because x-rays like to go through things. Instead, you have to work with a weird ricochet lens for fine aim while pointing the entire machine. Pretty cool idea for a super weapon or something though, or a spinal weapon on a big ship. Next up is the phased array laser. This is a different way of doing the lens end of the laser that lets you point the beam without needing to physically move anything, and it can change direction instantly. I'm going to take this explanation from this excellent write-up on the Galactic Library by Luke Campbell, who also made the upcoming example pictures. Do you remember doing this double-slit experiment in school to demonstrate diffraction and interference patterns? All this is based on that physics. Let's take a laser aperture that's a little hexagon, which makes this diffraction pattern. If we take two little hexagons and stick them beside each other, their patterns interfere to make this funky pattern here. But if we put those hexagon lasers out of phase with each other, that is we alter how the waves line up, it's possible to change the mixed diffraction pattern. The next thing to learn is that the diffraction pattern from our large aperture makes a smaller spot, which is beneficial for laser weapons because that focuses the energy in a smaller area where it can do more damage. If we group up a bunch of smaller apertures, their diffraction patterns interfere to approximate the small spot from our large aperture, and this is where things get really clever. If we do what we did before with the two hexagons and change the phase of the individual small apertures in our group hexagon, we can move their collective dot around. 
Now it is limited to the inside of the large spot from any one small aperture, but just like how larger apertures make smaller spots, smaller apertures make larger spots. Shrink the apertures down and you get a larger area you can move the array's collective spot around it. If you go really tiny, below the wavelength of the laser light itself, then you can point at anything the aperture can draw a line of sight to, without ever needing to physically move anything. There's a ton of obvious pros for weapons using this tech, like being able to instantly point anywhere, but there are technical issues. We can do phased array radars pretty easily because they work at relatively low frequency with long wavelengths. Setting all this up for the eeny weeny wavelengths of laser light is going to be very difficult. Imagine making laser apertures only a few hundred nanometers across and having to phase control all of them. Do you go for a trade-off with having a longer wavelength on your laser, which doesn't retain focus as well over long range, but is easier to make array elements for because they'll be larger? There's a bit of potential for differentiation between tech levels of factions here, much like how Mass Effect's lore has Solarian ships opting to use short wavelength near ultraviolet lasers for their extra range. Come to think of it, if Mass Effect's Guardian lasers used phased arrays, that would neatly give a reason why ships don't ever look like they have any laser turrets. The explanation for the third idea comes from Matterbeam's Tough SF blog, and it's about using a laser to improve the effectiveness of a particle beam by reducing its beam divergence, how much it spreads out over distance. This is bad for an energy weapon because it spreads out the energy in the beam over a larger area, making it less effective. And okay yes, this one isn't really a laser weapon in and of itself, but it's still cool and the laser is the bit that makes this special particle divergence happens for two main reasons. If a beam has a positive or negative electrical charge, then the particles in it are going to repel each other, causing electrostatic bloom. Thermal bloom happens because the hot particles like to jiggle about, causing the whole beam to expand, and this happens to even neutrally charged beams. But it is possible to cool down the particles before their final launch, so they go fast in the one direction you fired them, but don't jiggle around side to side. This stream of cold particles is also needed to couple them to the laser beam which gets wrapped around the particle beam. The laser has a gradient to its intensity that nudges particles back towards the middle, and the particles having a higher index of refraction than the vacuum of space keeps the laser from spreading out. So both elements of the beam expand far, far less, even over millions of kilometers. These coupled beams have so much effective range that aiming at your target becomes the limiting factor. At longer ranges, there's so much light delay they can just keep dodging out of the way. In fact, this tech is actually intended more for propulsion than as a weapon, shooting the combined beam at something that wants to receive it. So where coupled beams shine as weapons is in engaging things that cannot move, like zapping a space station from across the solar system. There's a few ways to counter particle beam attacks, but there's also one method that's specific to coupled beams, a counter laser with a different gradient. Since the offensive laser beam is travelling at light speed, it arrives before the slower particles it's guiding, giving the target a warning that they're about to be hit. If they fire their own laser with the reverse gradient directly back up the beam path, it can force the particles to spread out, reducing the damage done by them. But shining a laser down a laser with any accuracy in that short period of time is going to be very hard. I know all three of these concepts are very technical and don't necessarily fit in any given setting, but realistic stuff doesn't have to stay that way. You can easily take these concepts and apply them to softer sci-fi, that's part of the reason I love talking about them and realistic stuff in general. If energy weapons aren't your vibe though, subscribe now for a future look at advanced kinetic weapons. You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon where you can get our frigate and space fighter design reference books. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters and thank you for watching.